We are in the beginning weeks of a series, Beholding the Beauty of the Lord. And it arises out of two or three phrases that we find in Psalm 27. David writes there, One thing I have desired, one thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Just by way of a brief review, we have already recognized that beauty is something that moves us because of the loveliness or the attraction of what we are observing. We experience certain dimensions of pleasure and satisfaction as we behold something that is beautiful. And in beholding the beauty of the Lord, we are beholding His character. We learn about His beauty, we observe His beauty as we inquire in His temple. That is, to make a detailed examination of the evidence of what we see in the temple. And we do that by dwelling intellectually, spiritually, emotionally in the presence of God. So though we don't see anything with our eyes, specifically, we see it with our spiritual awareness. And I'm very anticipatory today as we look at the beauty of the self-providing God. We have focused upon seeking God's face. We have focused upon the God who is with us. And today, the framework of the beauty of the self-providing God. In the scriptures, we see quite a spectrum of descriptions about God. From Isaiah 40, we read this. Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? Who has taught him? With whom did he take counsel, and who instructed him and taught him the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? These are rhetorical questions the prophet is asking nobody Nobody, nobody. He continues on. Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket and are counted as the small dust on the scales. The nations, just a thin layer of dust on the scales. All nations before him are as nothing and they are counted by him less than nothing and worthless. There's a particular emphasis the prophet is giving here. To whom will you liken God, he goes on, or what likeness will you compare to him? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Now, observations like this from the prophet Isaiah and others similar to it from some of the other biblical writers speak of what Bible students call the transcendence of God. God is big. He's far away and above. He is holy and completely different from you and me. And so we sing hymns such as this one. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes. The transcendence of God, the bigness of of God. That's one dimension that we see spoken about in the scriptures. Now here's another in contrast. Psalm 139. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and you are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue But behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. 
It is high. I cannot attain it. And Bible students over the centuries, when they observe texts like this, thoughts like this, they have another term. It is the eminence of God. The eminence of God. That God is near, close, involved, engaged personally in the very details of our lives. And so we sing songs like, His eye is on the sparrow, and I know He watches me. Transcendence! Eminence. Mickey Gumbel, clergyman from another faith community, makes a very insightful observation here. It is only when we understand the transcendence of God that we see how amazing His eminence is and what a huge privilege it is to be able to enjoy God's intimate friendship. God's transcendence and His eminence come together in the sanctuary. The sanctuary is probably the most comprehensive picture of God's relationship to us throughout all of Scripture. There are various images that we have of how God relates to us, but the sanctuary is the one that threads its way from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And we've already noticed in our study in this particular series, passages such as Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 6 and Isaiah 14, Daniel 7, and, and the final chapters of Revelation, they speak of the transcendence of God. God is out there, wholly other, wholly different than us. But we've also looked at Isaiah 7, the God who is Emmanuel, the God who is with us, echoed again in the birth of Jesus. You shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. We've seen it presented in John chapter 1. That in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were made, and there was nothing made that was made without the Word. And then that Word in John 1, verse 14, becomes flesh and dwells among us. And in John chapter 14, words that are well known that Jesus spoke to His disciples on the night that He was betrayed. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many mansions. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself so that where I am, you may be also. Transcendence? Eminence. We've seen previously in our study of the beauty of the Lord that the heavenly sanctuary had a central, actually not a, it had the central purpose in the cosmos before sin entered the universe. It was a place of praise and worship. The sanctuary was the capital of the universe. It was the seat of God's authority. It was also referred to as God's house, His temple. So with that background, let's take a closer look now at the beauty of the self-providing God. We've already noticed from Ezekiel chapter 28, in reference to this heavenly intelligence that rebelled against God, that that angel was in Eden, the garden of God. Eden is a word that means happiness and pleasure and bliss. That individual, that entity, that intellectual being was also referred to as an anointed cherub who covers. He was on the holy mountain of God. These are all sanctuary terms. And the Eden that is described here is in heaven. So when we come to Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and we read about the Garden of Eden there, we are led to conclude rightly that there is a heavenly counterpart to the earthly 
garden. The Garden of Eden has sanctuary connections. And just as Eden in heaven was connected to bliss and happiness and pleasure, so Eden on earth is also the setting of bliss and happiness and pleasure. And part of that pleasure came when the Creator stated, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then God blessed them. And God saw everything. And it was very good. So the Creator made the first sanctuary as Eden. Bible scholars look at all these descriptions and identify the Garden of Eden as the first sanctuary on earth. Just as there was a heavenly Eden, there is an earthly Eden that in some measure resembles the heavenly Eden. This is all a foundation to what we see later on in Exodus chapter 25 in which God tells Moses, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them and make this tabernacle and all of its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. So the earthly Eden in a like manner was somewhat of a pattern of the heavenly Eden. Now you may recall if you've been here on prior weeks in which we've been in this particular focus that Dr. Richard Davidson of the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University has written an amazing work called Song for the Sanctuary. And I am heavily relying upon Dr. Davidson's work here in this book. It's about that thick. And I am only giving you various highlights because it is very involved. But at this juncture, he makes this comment. There seems to be a vertical typology between the original heavenly Eden sanctuary temple and its earthly Eden copy. If the heavenly Eden functioned as a sanctuary temple, then it may be deduced that the Eden copy or counterpart on earth also functioned as a sanctuary. Numerous biblical scholars have pointed out various hints throughout Scripture supporting the conclusion that the pre-fall Garden of Eden and its surroundings is to be identified as the original sanctuary temple on earth. Hmm. Various hints. What are some of those hints? Well, there are intentional terms that are used both of describing Eden and its surroundings along with the sanctuary as we know it more readily from Exodus chapter 25. There's reference made in Genesis 2 that there was an eastward orientation to Eden. We find the same with the wilderness sanctuary that it faced the east. There is a tree of life in the midst of the garden. We read about that in Genesis chapter 2. Then when we look at Exodus 25 with the descriptions of God dwelling in the midst of his people, we find that it is the same biblical term. Midst in the Garden of Eden, midst in the wilderness sanctuary. Leviticus 26, 11 and 12, draws out the beauty of this midst identification. I will set my tabernacle among you. I will walk among you, that is, in the midst of you, and be your God, and you shall be my people. Now, if you're familiar with Revelation, you know that these very words are echoed again at the very end of Scripture. But we're looking right now at the hints identifying Eden as a sanctuary. Adam and Eve are assigned the task of tending and keeping the garden. And those biblical words for tend and keep are the very same terms that are used to describe the work 
the role of priests and Levites in serving and guarding the sanctuary. Do you see the connections between the sanctuary of Eden and the sanctuary of the wilderness? In the creation account, we read about a mist that wafts up from the earth. As we read about the description of the wilderness sanctuary in Exodus 30, that same word is used. There's incense that wafts up and rises up and throughout the sanctuary. This is just a fraction, a fraction of the terminological links between Eden and the sanctuary. Do you begin to see how important this is now that we believe that Genesis is real history? You know, there's quite a few in the Christian community, the larger Christian community, who look at the first chapters of Genesis, chapters 1 through 11, as somewhat of a myth. There are some who look at creation week as one day, representing a thousand years and that there was a development. But when we see these tie-ins to the sanctuary in Exodus 25 through 40, we see that Moses is very intentional in the language that he uses. And I've wondered to myself, well, did Moses write Genesis first, or did he write Exodus first, and then went back to Genesis? Because he's using the same terminology. And it's not by accident that he uses these particular terms. He wants to show the connection between the original sanctuary and how it was the foundation for the sanctuary that God gave him specific instructions regarding and its construction. Here are some other hints that we find. And this is fascinating. At least I think it's fascinating. So I hope you think it's fascinating as well. The creation week has a similar progression as the building of the sanctuary. Actually, we probably ought to put that in reverse. The building of the sanctuary has a similar progression as creation week. There is a gathering of raw materials in Genesis chapter 1. There is a gathering of raw materials in Exodus 25. Just as there are six days of creation in the instructions that God gave to Moses in regards to the design and the development of the wilderness sanctuary, there are six Sections And each of these sections is identified with the saying, the Lord said to Moses, the Lord said to Moses, the Lord said to Moses. And then, just as there is a culmination with Sabbath at creation, there is a culmination and a conclusion of Sabbath with the sanctuary design and development and construction. Dr. Davidson, once again, the striking parallel not only invites us to see the building of the sanctuary as a new creation, but to see the creation account as connected to the sanctuary. Now, look at some of these terms that we find used in Genesis, which are picked up again in Exodus. God saw everything he had made. And indeed, it was very good. On the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. And then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. Now, those of us who have been around the Bible for a while, we're pretty familiar with those words. Describing the end of creation week and how it came to a culmination with Sabbath. Now in Exodus 39 and 40, these same terms are used not quite as much in a compact space with sentences and paragraphs, but they are kind of filtered through the final two chapters of Exodus as it gives the wrap-up of the construction of the sanctuary. Thus, all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting was finished, we read in Exodus 39. 
And the children of Israel did according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses. Moses looked over all the work, and indeed, they had done it. They made it as the Lord commanded. And Moses blessed them, and Moses finished the work. There is a striking parallel. The words that are used demonstrate a linkage between creation week and the sanctuary. Now, this is kind of obvious. As we think about the self-providing God, the beauty of the self-providing God, this is obvious, but we don't want to take it for granted. Without the Creator, none of us would be here right now, would we? <laughs> the Creator self-provided on our behalf. The Creator then self-provides in the instructions in regards to the development of the sanctuary. We see here this beautiful counterpart of transcendence and eminence. The great God of the universe wants to come and dwell with us, to be intimate with us. We read in Psalm 33, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. Big God. Big, big, big God. But in Genesis 2, 7, And the Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Transcendence. Eminence. God's hands, his fingerprints were all over what he was creating in his own image. We don't know how long Eden lasted in all of its bliss and happiness, its beauty, but we know that that came to an end. As we read in Genesis 3, the account of the deception, the temptation that occurred, with the lure to both the woman and then the man, if you partake of this fruit, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And what significance there is in the details of that conversation, the details of which we're not going to go to in, at this time. But the Creator comes and He asks the question, what is this you have done? What is this, Adam, you have done? What is this, Eve, you have done? What is this, serpent, you have done? And this is the first investigative judgment that we have in Scripture. Now, some of you may know the implications of what I just said, but we will be getting there at some point in the future, and it is significant to note that there was a judgment that took place in the Garden of Eden. There were consequences to the lack of faith and the breaking of the relationship but there is a God who provides. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, the Creator states to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. There was a provision for reconciliation. This is the first promise of good news, gospel that we have in the scriptures. In speaking of that seed, Galatians chapter 3 specifically identifies it as Christ. So now with Genesis 3, the sanctuary is not only the place of fellowship and intimacy and praise, but the sanctuary, the Eden sanctuary, introduces us to the reality of sin and death. It introduces us to the meaning of grace and forgiveness and reconciliation. And with that promise, the Lord, the Creator, provided for Adam and his wife tunics of skin, and He clothed them. And Adam and Eve are instructed in the basic meaning of the sacrificial ministry 
to be later unfolded with greater detail in the sanctuary. God's clothing of Adam and Eve was not just a covering of their physical nudity, but a covering of their guilt and shame, a spiritual covering, the robe of righteousness that we would learn about later in the New Testament era, a spiritual covering provided by the death of the coming divine substitute, the messianic lamb of God. This is the beauty of the self-providing God. As we continue to flip the pages of the book of Genesis, we look in on the experience of Noah after the flood and how Noah built an altar to the Lord and he took up every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Where did they get that idea? It stems all the way back to the Garden of Eden and what the Creator had shared with Adam and Eve as they then shared it with their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-great-great-grandchildren. As we flip a few more pages in the book of Genesis, we come to Genesis chapter 12 and the experience of Abraham and stretches through chapter 25. And we've looked at Abraham's experience a couple of years ago in our Relentless Love series, but we revisit it now through a slightly different framework. God came to Abraham, and he instructed him to get out of your country, leave your family, and go to a land that I will show you. And as you respond to my invitation, Abraham, I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. I will bless those who bless you. In all the families of the earth, they shall be blessed through you. Abraham responded, and when he arrives in the land that God directed him to come to, he built an altar to the Lord, and he called on the name of the Lord. He does this periodically as he moves from location to location around what was then known as Canaan. And in the experience of Abraham, we see an interesting tension of faith and unfaith. Yes, he is the father of the, unfa of the faithful, but he also had seasons of of doubt and fear. He feared for his life because of his beautiful wife, Sarah. And so he lied about the actual relationship of marriage that they had. He doubted at times that God was actually going to fulfill his promise of making from him a great nation because he had no child. At times, he was threatened with war. So all of these experiences were tests to Abraham along the way as he broadened and deepened from one chapter of life to the next in his development of faith. In chapter 15, we read this. After these things, actually after a military experience, after these things, chapter 15 begins, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. And in essence, Abram responds, Oh yeah? Really? I've been waiting for you to fulfill this. Lord God, what will you give me? Seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. The only heir I have that I could maybe qualify as having been a legal heir is, is my steward, my servant. Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. I'm thinking of Eliezer. But God responds to Abram, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Abram, come outside now. This is God talking to Abram. Come outside and look toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And God said, so shall be your descendants. Can you count the stars? So shall be the number of your descendants. 
And I don't know what changed in Abram's attitude from the beginning of this conversation till now, but the very next line, and he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Aren't we the exact same way? We can have days in which we're full of faith. Days in which we're, mm, mm, I don't know, I'm struggling. But then that faith gets renewed. God continues his conversation to Abram. I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur, out of the Chaldeans, to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? And then in chapter 15, in the verses that follow, is a rather, what shall we say, bizarre, for us today, even repulsive action that takes place. God instructs Abram to bring a number of animals, a heifer, a goat, a ram, and a couple species of birds, turtle doves and pigeons. And he instructs Abram to sacrifice those animals and to literally disassemble them, half them. Place one half over here, place the other half over here. The birds were not severed, but they were divided. God gives this instruction to Abram because of a cultural association with what was going on. He was bringing sacrifices in order for a covenant or a treaty to be established. In Genesis 15, we continue to read that it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark that behold there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. The divided heifer, the divided goat, the divided lamb, sheep. There were two visible symbols that passed through the middle of those severed animals. A smoking oven and a burning torch. Now we have the luxury of knowing what those symbols refer to because of what we read later in Exodus. The smoke and the fire are symbolic of a divine presence. And in Genesis 15, Moses goes on to write, On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. God made a covenant with Abram in this rather bizarre and for us repulsive ceremony. Dr. Davidson helps us with the insight. In ancient Near Eastern treaties, when an overlord entered into a treaty or a covenant with a servant state, he would have them cut in pieces a slaughtered animal and pass through the pieces. The servant, acknowledging by passing through the pieces, may it be done to me as was done to this animal if I am unfaithful to the covenant. But when you read the account there, Abram never passed through the divided animals. Only the symbols of God passed through those animals. This is absolutely astounding. Radically contrary to the ancient Near Eastern practice where only the servant and not the overlord moved through the pieces, God himself, the divine overlord, passed through the pieces, stating in essence, if I break my promise, let me be dismembered. That is absolutely incredible that God humbles himself through this cultural practice, guaranteeing the fulfillment of his promises. This is the beauty of the self-providing God. God is the one who provides for us. The story of Abram continues to go on with other experiences in which there were tensions between faith and unfaith until we come to Genesis chapter 22, 
which then starts off with this announcement. Now it came to pass, after these things, that God tested Abraham. Very, very significant qualification. God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Abraham, here I am. Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Just as years ago in Ur, Abraham responded to the Lord by following his lead. He didn't know where he would wind up. I'll let you know when you're there. Now, decades later, the same instruction is given. But oh, what a challenge now would await when they reach their destination. Can you wrestle with, can you appreciate the conflict of commands that Abraham must have been struggling with? This is not the God I've known. He's in a moral dilemma. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, we read this, You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. For every abomination of the Lord which he hates, they have done to their gods. For they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. This is a very, very severe intellectual, moral dilemma that Abraham finds himself in. The book Patriarchs and Prophets helps us out a little bit when we read there, by perverted conceptions of divine attributes, the heathen nations were led to believe that human sacrifices were necessary to secure the favor of their deities. And yet God comes to Abraham and he tests him. He tests him. Some time ago, our Wednesday night prayer fellowship spent a number of weeks in a book titled The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. And A.W. Tozer, with inspired imagination, helps us to get in the inside of Abraham and what he very likely was wrestling with. Abraham was old when Isaac was born, old enough indeed to have been his grandfather. And the child became at once the delight and idol of his heart. From that moment, when he first stooped to take the tiny form awkwardly in his arms, he was an eager love slave of his son. And God went out of his way to comment on the strength of his, his affection. Remember? Your son. Your only son. Your son whom you love. It is not hard to understand. The baby represented everything sacred to his father's heart. The promises of God, the covenants, the hopes of the years. As he watched him grow from babyhood into young manhood, the heart of the old man was knit closer and closer with the life of his son till at last the relationship bordered upon the perilous. It was then that God stepped in to save both father and son from the consequences of an uncleansed love. The sacred writer, referring to Moses, spares us a close-up of the agony that, of that night on the slopes near Beersheba when the aged man had it out with God. But respectful imagination may view in awe the bent form and convulsive wrestling alone under the stars, possibly not again until a greater than Abraham wrestled in the Garden of Gethsemane did such a mortal pain visit a human soul. If only the man himself might have been allowed to die. That would have been a thousand times easier, for he was old now, and to die would have been no great ordeal for one who had walked with God so long. The wrestling, trying to figure out, God, what are you doing? This doesn't sound like you at all. Yet Abraham rose early in the morning, and he saddled his donkey, and he took two of his young men with him, and Isaac, his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and rose and went to the place of which God had told him. And then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and he saw the place afar off. And as they reached that base 
of that hill, that mountain, Abram said to his young men, stay here, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. And we, we will come back to you. So Abram took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, yes, son, look, the fire, the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. And so the two of them went together. It seems as though at this point Isaac doesn't really understand all the implications of what may or may not happen. But they came to the place of which God had told him. Patriarchs and prophets, once again, helps us to get inside. Then with trembling voice, Abraham unfolded to his son the divine message. It was with terror and amazement that Isaac learned his fate, but he offered no resistance. He could have escaped his doom had he chosen to do so. The grief-stricken old man, exhausted with the struggle of those three terrible days, could not have opposed the will of the young, vigorous youth. But Isaac had been trained from childhood to ready, trusting obedience. And as the purpose of God was open before him, he yielded a willing submission. He was a sharer in Abraham's faith, and he felt that he was honored in being called to give his life as an offering to God. Now, did they have the conversation that Abraham had with the servant at the base of the mountain? We are going to worship, and we will come back. Isaac tenderly seeks to lighten the father's grief and encourages his nerveless hands to bind the cords that confine him to the altar. And then at the precise moment, now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham now atop this mountain. Intention, our faith and unfaith. Perhaps Abram's entire life passes before him. Those seasons when he had been strong as well as those seasons when he had been weak. Testing, taking place, minute by minute, there atop Mount Moriah. Abram said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. Now, the book of Hebrews looks back at this and gives us this commentary. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called. Concluding, Abraham, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. And as Abraham has his arm raised, the divine voice cries out, Abraham, Abraham, do not lay your hand on the ladder. Do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Abraham must have anticipated that something like this was going to happen. <laughs> and he lifted his eyes and he looked and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. And so Abraham went and took the ram and he offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, 
In the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. This is the beauty of the self-providing God. Jesus, one day in the temple, doing intellectual boxing with religious leaders, made this comment. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Before Abraham was, I am. The self-providing God starts in Eden, providing a garden of pleasure, bliss, and happiness. The self-providing God provides a promise that forgiveness and reconciliation will take place through the seed. The self-providing God walks through the dismembered sacrificial animals, saying, if I renege on my promise... You can dismember me, the self-providing God, atop Mount Moriah, provides a ram as a sacrifice at the critical moment. Romans 8, verse 32, resonates with all of this. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things. Oh, God is a big God. He's way out there, above and beyond us, in light, inapproachable, inaccessible, but He is the eminent God who dwells among us. And it is only when we understand the transcendence of God that we see how amazing His eminence is and what a huge privilege it is to be able to enjoy God's intimate friendship. Hmm. I operate in my relationship with God not so much in the framework of I have to, but I get to. Not so much in the framework of obligation but from the framework of privileged opportunity. As we will be entering into prayer in just a few moments, I invite you to reflect on how the self-providing God has provided for you this past week, this past month, over the years, even through the tests that He has allowed you to experience maybe some of which he directly brought into your pathway. But you have proved him that he is the self-providing God.